Hey, toy lovers of all ages. Welcome back to the Spectre Creative Channel with me, your host, Scott Toy Guru Nightlick, and today we're talking about toy sales. All kind of toy sales. Clearance sales, BOGO sales, as well as, shall we say, inexpensive toys that are produced for inexpensive stores. I've been getting a lot of questions and comments uh, on, well, on the YouTube channel in the comment section. That's uh, that is what the comment section is for, I suppose, asking questions about how retailers deal with toy companies when it comes to clearance sales, promotions, who pays for these, how do toys wind up on clearance? Is this something where the toy company is losing money? Is it something where the retailers losing money? And how in the world do sort of discount channels? carry both high-end or, you know, expensive product as well as really inexpensive product. So with that in mind, I want to jump in because there's not really one specific answer. There's lots of different ways this happens, and I hope I can clarify, I guess, some of the mystery around how different promotions at retail work in the toy industry because there's a lot of different kinds. There's, there's BOGOs, there's couponing, there's clearance, there's I guess at the end of the day, there's not one formula because every different type of sale has falls into kind of a different category. And some of the sales are triggered by product not selling. Other times are triggered by product that is selling and wanting to hype it. Other times it's clearing out bad product because the entertainment that it's tied to, like a movie or TV show, doesn't do well. So who picks up the tab on this? What happens when a movie, TV show, streaming show, whatever it is these days, radio program, flops, does not perform, as they say in the industries, does not meet sales expectations. So when that happens and you have to clear out product that's attached to entertainment that underperforms, to use another uh, bingo term there from marketing, well, how do retailers, and you know, I'm talking about the larger retailers, deal with something like this? We don't really have toy stores anymore, but as far as funding it, as far as providing cash, well, let's look at big box stores, first of all. These are your stores like your Walmarts, your Targets. Do we still have Kmarts? Meyer, Fred Meyer. Yeah, even these are shrinking in the number of them we have. And when they mark down product from what's called the suggested retail price, and there's also a minimum price called a map price, but that's a whole other story. Well, all of these stores do have markdown policies on how this works. And markdowns are used, one, to maintain margins for the retailer to ensure they're not losing money, but also to engage with the customer to get their attention. Sales spike when you have as much as even just 10% off, or I should say as little as 10% off, or more so you know, if you have 50% off. And there is definitely a bell curve between when the product is selling at full price and it's selling at a discount and not wanting to cross over into the part where you're losing money. So when a product goes on clearance, I'm not talking about a sale, but it's actually marked to clear it out. Well, a lot of times this is funded actually by the toy companies or video game companies, the, the, the candle companies, the furniture companies. It's basically like Ed McMahon showing up at your door. A lot of them, especially if it's tied to entertainment, it, the contract comes with a promise that they will fund marketing dollars should product need to be marked down to clearance it out. So toy companies do pay for this. What's different are what are called value channels. So outside of big box stores, you have different retailers that sell toys already at hugely marked down prices. You know, stores like Ollie's, stores like Dollar Tree, well, any of the dollar stores, there's a whole bunch of them, and they're, they're actually completely different stores, but they all have the sort of the same type of retail footprint. Stores like Five and Below. So what these stores are doing is they are buying buy the pallet or even buy the shipping container product that was maybe intended to go to mass retail, but because the entertainment didn't do well, retailers will turn around and, well, more or less cancel orders. So a big box retailer that's expecting to have a replenishment order, well, 
a lot of times you're basically taking bets on product and the manufacturing company is taking bets on how much to produce based on several factors. And this tends to be what differentiates a good brand manager from a great brand manager. So a great brand manager is someone who understands not just current trends, but they understand what the customer is thinking and their emotional connection to the product. Why are they buying it? And ideally, they also have a very in-depth knowledge of the property that they're working on. And this is tough because properties change all the time. You could be working on one property one year that you know a ton about, and another the next year you don't. And I would often, you know, go to brand managers working on properties and say, hey, I know a lot about this property, you know, let me help you. So what the companies don't want is a giant warehouse full of product because this is extremely expensive. Not only do they have to store the product, which is literally costing money per unit on shelf every day, which is also why doing second runs of collector product is dangerous. And it literally is like, you know, shredding your own money because you're paying for product that's not selling. It's just sitting there. And that's why they'll hit the liquidate button. I mean, it's not literally a button, but it kind of almost is because I remember certain companies I worked for, emails would go around and it would say, okay, are you ready to liquidate? And this is the part where toys will be sold at a fraction of the price, attempting to sell at least at the cost to manufacture and ship it so you don't lose money. And when the entertainment underperforms, if it has product tied to it, well, then this product that may have been intended for a big box store because the entertainment doesn't do well and the manufacturer doesn't want to pay to store it, they will sell it to a discount seller at a fraction of the cost, sometimes even less than the cost to produce it, just to get out of storing it. Which is why when you go into stores like Ollie's or Five and Below, you'll see product that you know, may have been hanging at Target or Walmart or other big box stores just a few months earlier at full price, and suddenly the figures are only $5 or, you know, even less than that, which is often less than it costs to actually manufacture the figure, especially when you take into consideration shipping costs. So these discount channels essentially function and survive as, I don't want to call it dumping grounds, but it's basically a place to take product that is intended for full price, but for one reason or another, big box stores don't want it anymore, mostly because the, con the, the uh, content doesn't perform. So what about things like this, though? What about like these super cheap dollar toys that are produced for channels like this? Well, this is a different category. So almost all of the major toy companies are actually embracing this now. It's really a new trend for them. It used to be kind of smaller companies that would work on making really inexpensive product. And nowadays, most big companies are doing this too. And the big reason we're doing this is because... What do you think of my desk? I made it myself. And I have all these pieces left. Uh, yep, it's basically that. It's providing a low-cost alternative to getting, some, you know, getting an expensive desk. You can get a cheap desk. So... Customers do want, there is a very big market for very low-cost products. Bootleg toys take this place usually internationally. But here in the U.S., an emerging trend that's happened in the last few years is companies actually producing what are called cost-reduced versions of toys specific for discount channel. So not only will discount channels take overstock, but now, in lieu of taking sort of a six-inch black series figure like this that retails for $20, a toy company will produce a less expensive version, less articulation, less deco, less accessories that they can sell at the discount channel prices. And not just six-inch. We've seen this at three and three-fourth, not to keep picking on Star Wars, but it's just a good example because they've kind of embraced this discount channel distribution model where actual product is produced for these channels, because they're not going to take the vintage series three and three fourth, but if the discount, if the manufacturer can produce an item that's kind of the equivalent at very low price, usually by removing articulation, deco, and accessories, well, it's a win. And now the discount channel is basically becoming a double solution for the toy industry. It will take overstock that was intended at full price 
and remove it from warehouses that manufacturers don't want it sitting in and costing them money. And now by producing products specifically for them that's intended to be low cost, well, you know, while this product may not be intended for collectors, for kids, it's great. And especially for low income, you know, lower economic areas, it's fantastic because then they can get, you know, the joy of having these figures. And if they can also be a home for figures that just won't sell at retail, hey, it's a double win and that's how value channels fit into the uh, overall toy industry. I hope this video clarified who pays for promotions and how discount stores get their product. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Share this video, leave a comment, leave a subscription. It helps tell YouTube to share this with more people. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.